Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the McKercher uh, Speaker Series at the University of Saskatchewan College of Law. Uh, my name is Brent Cotter. I'm a professor at the college, and I'm the chair of the Speakers Committee, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and in a moment or two turn this over to uh, uh, Elder Maria Campbell for a, a blessing and to uh, Senator Beth, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm the Senator Beth, uh, to Beth Bilson, um, who will be the moderator of, of the panel, a truly outstanding panel today to address the questions related to reflections on the impact of COVID-19 on online adjudication. I won't say any more about the panelists uh, other than acknowledging their distinction, but leave it to Dean Bilson to introduce them. Um, as we gather here today, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. It does give me a great pleasure to uh, introduce and turn over uh, to the opening uh, prayer, uh, the uh, remarks of Elder Maria Campbell. Um, Maria Campbell is our cultural advisor at the uh, College of Law at the University of Saskatchewan. It's, a, of course, a distinguished position, but pales in comparison to the achievements of her career and many other distinctions uh, for which she has been recognized. She's a, a, a Métis leader and elder, fluent in many languages, a Cree, Michif, Ojibwa, English, has served with us with distinction and benefited our students enormously over the past few years. She's the recipient of the Order of Canada and of honorary degrees um, and is um, much admired within our community. Um, elder Campbell, could I turn it over to you to uh, bring us a, a, a prayer? And hello to everybody out there. I'm, uh, I, I was offered tobacco and, uh, and these ribbons from uh, Brie to do the opening for this. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about this before I begin. Uh, the offerings are, uh, are to, in, in my case, to the grandmother, our first grandmother, who's the keeper of laws and the keeper of children, educator of children and the tobacco is the offering to her. These will be put in a ceremonial fire and uh, I want to thank Bree for, for offering them. I um, just wanted to say um, something before uh, and read something before I begin the prayer. And it's, uh, it's from a, a, a book that's the selected writings of Richard Wagamese. Richard passed away in March of uh, 2017. He was a, a columnist, a respected columnist for many years. He was also a novelist. He wrote uh, film scripts, uh, poetry, and, and also uh, published, this is the second book that was published on reflections. And often when, uh, when I'm going to do an opening, I uh, sometime will do a prayer in Cree. Sometime I just have a conversation with, with creator about whatever that's important to, to us. But uh, sometime I find somebody that, that has said something before that I think is really important. And, uh, and I feel that it's what Richard has done. And I'd like to read a piece of, of this reflection to you and then do the prayer following that simply because it addresses, it addresses access to justice, to truth and to reconciliation. Um, when, when we translate it into Cree, the translation is a bit different in, in English, but uh, I think it's very powerful and beautiful and, and important to, to what other work that you're going to be doing at this, this conference, the discussions you're going to have. And, um, and just gives you something to, to think about. Um, Richard was an Anishinaabe, and he came from three generations of uh, residential school uh, people. He was raised in foster homes. He did time in prison. He was into addictions. His life was just a terrible mess. And one day he walked onto a set, a, a documentary film set, and, uh, and asked for help and for a job. And his life totally changed, and, and he's one of probably Canada's, Canada's most celebrated writers. 
He was very young when he passed away. His young life, uh, he never uh, had access to justice. And he spent uh, the rest of his life as, as a writer, um, fighting for access for justice for, for people. So uh, I, I want to read this and then I'll do the prayer. We wake to a day of worry, but it's a time to remember that we are homo sapiens, translated literally to mean wise men. And even though we have the greatest capacity for cruelty of any creature in creation, we also have the staunchest capacity for love, mercy, compassion, acceptance, forgiveness, empathy, and kindness. We are built for survival because of these virtues. One man cannot change that. It will be a difficult time. But we were given knees on which to offer our humility to creator and legs to stand strong in the face of adversity and hearts and minds and spirits that are wired for community. We have hands to reach out to one another. We have the inherent knowledge that we are one family and that's our saving grace. So I would like us to put our hearts together and our minds and and in the conversations that we're going to have that grandmother sits in that circle with, with all of you and, and with us. And we put all of our children in that circle too because whatever comes out of these conversations and the conversations people are having all across our land on reconciliation and, and especially access to justice that that she'll be there and, and that her wisdom and her kindness and generosity will make us remember that the work we do is uh, for future generations of our children. And, and that's who I'm speaking for now. Thank you, Magadhi Bechagin. Igo Kerenaskum Dan. Igo Kerenaskum Dan e Bemiuki Sagaganot. Igo Kemiasikum Matsun Gabia Wihia. Vetsem kakanoimia, kana tohtauia, et kueskuu maka kuisihtaa meskenau. Vitsihin annohtaui, kueska muhtea, kueska istahkuna maakse vatsuen, niu, niu vitsetuen, katti maake imtoja, kuitsiitoja. Aminan gaueski, kistamina kenen askum, kistamine kuetsem, katti maake imia, Ego kes miuna kuchigain, a kopan magakits kaman, nimiasik, which he nan can aspetata. Amina no kum no to go at a yukan, his tamina can an askum. Pay with up much a gogic, a wee pig's wetchik, a wee mamma a pitchik, and stortake can stort a wachik, I see him noa. A pig's west maachik to us him sinawa. Arnokum picked him again nan. The witch in Nancy to Scalman. And Mosoma can never be a kistorm in a kinanaskum now. Kistorm in a quitim now, squat a magagan right to make me to a mias to go to a baby to a maga. Pick the magim nan, pick the magim nan. Not now, he picked the magim nan. Hey, hey, see. Hi, and thank you very much, Maria, for, for that. Uh, opening prayer. Um, uh, I'm going to in, uh, briefly introduce uh, Dean Bilson, but before I do, I wanted to provide an acknowledgement to Bria Lowenberger, who is really the mastermind and uh, hardworking person who constructed this excellent panel to consider this question for you. Uh, Bria was one of our most dynamic students while she was a law student and uh, now serves at the College of Law as the Access to Justice Coordinator for the college and the Director of Create Justice. And I wanted to extend a thanks to Bree for the fine work she's done, dynamic as ever, in creating such an excellent panel uh, for you today. The panel will be moderated by Dean Beth Bilson, who is the Interim Dean of the College of Education here at the University of Saskatchewan, her second deanship if I may say, Beth. Beth served in a distinguished capacity as Dean of the College of Law in the early 2000s and was a leader in organizing us in terms of a strategic direction for the college. 
She's also served um, in a distinguished capacity as a professor and as the chair of the uh, Saskatchewan Labor Relations Board and as the university secretary. It seems like there is no position, including moderating this panel, that Beth can't do with excellence and skill. I'll turn it over to you, Beth, to introduce your panelists and, uh, and take away the session. Uh, thank you very much, Brent. And I would like to uh, acknowledge as well that I live and work on the traditional territory of Treaty 6 and the homeland of the Métis. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be moderating this panel on what is really quite a, uh, what turns out to be quite a festive event uh, because um, it is the fifth anniversary pretty much today of the Create Justice Center at the College of Law at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, which is the Center for Research, Education and Action Towards Equal Justice. I think I got that right. Um, and the Create Justice Center is an offshoot of a wonderful institution in the College of Law or based in the College of Law the Dean's Forum, which in March will be celebrating its 10th anniversary. Um, and that is an annual forum which brings together um, it, major figures from uh, the courts, the legal profession, uh, the Ministry of Justice, uh, the College of Law and, and nonprofit organizations um, to talk about access to justice issues and to plan strategies for uh, change in this area. Uh, it has been ve a very successful um, venture and, and this particular topic that we're talking about this afternoon will be one of the topics that is considered uh, at the 10th annual Dean's Forum, uh, which will be happening in the spring of 2022. Um, this is the first event of um, this, the sixth annual Access to Justice Week in Saskatchewan. And I'd like to as well issue a special welcome to people from outside Saskatchewan who are taking part in this event as one of the events in the second annual National Access to Justice Week. Um, so we're getting a lot of mileage out of this panel. It's serving a number of, a number of purposes and, and I think you'll find the discussion very interesting. Um, the title of the panel is Reflections on the Impact of COVID-19 on Online Adjudication. And our three panelists, I think, are very well qualified to uh, speak to that uh, topic and to provide some insights based on their own experiences during COVID and their own thoughts about um, how, uh, how COVID has impacted uh, online adjudication and how online adjudication itself serves the interests of, of access to justice. Uh, so our panel um, consists of Shannon Salter, who is the chair of the BC Civil Resolution Tribunal, which is the first online tribunal in Canada, uh, which deals with a range of small claims, condominium and motor vehicle accident disputes. Um, our second panelist is, is Shannon Metivier, who was appointed to the position of Chief Judge of the Provincial Court of Saskatchewan uh, recently. Uh, and the third panelist is Dan Shapiro, who's a Saskatoon lawyer who in 2003 decided to devote himself exclusively to neutral work as a mediator arbitrator and adjudicator. Um, the form that we are going to use this afternoon is, is, is a conversational one. That is, I will be raising a question and asking each of the participants to address it in turn. Um, if, you, uh, if you do have a question, um, you could enter it in the chat. Uh, associated with this platform and um, and if we have time at the end of the session I will ask the panelists to address some of the questions that have been raised by our audience. But the first question I want to pose um, is 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 what the experience our panelists uh, had during the 
pandemic um, to say something about about what in their own environment was the experience they had um, and what did they think uh, on the basis of that experience what what were the benefits of, of proceeding in an online format uh, and what were some of the challenges um, so I think I'm going to start with with Chief Judge Metivier, um, I know that the Provincial Court of Saskatchewan um, had to make very dramatic and and significant changes in the way they operated to respond to the pandemic. And I'd be interested to hear what what your experience of that was. Thank you, Beth. First of all, uh, Bria, uh, thank you for inviting me to this event. I look forward always look forward to getting being reconnected uh, with events associated with the College of Law. And on this topic in particular, I think I have as much to learn as to say. So I'm very much looking forward to the conversation today and what I learned from the other panelists, which I expect will be a lot. Uh, Beth, your question asked about the experience of the provincial court with online adjudication. And, um, you know, I, 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 our, our experience was, I think, more than just with what I would consider online adjudication, but with virtual adjudication in general, because we have three different areas, I guess, uh, where we would use it or three different ways in which we would use that. Um, the presumption in court has traditionally been for in-person attendance and still is. So I consider virtual adjudication anything other than in-person attendance in court. And there's three um, uh, categories of that that the provincial court would typically use. We have our video conferencing units, which are um, uh, systems set up in court and then at endpoints. So in um, correctional facilities and police detachments and in circuit point locations where people would attend and be in front of those video units and connected with the court. Uh, the second uh, area where we use it would be like a WebEx or Zoom type of uh, event that we might use in case management conferences or have perhaps have a witness attend uh, virtually at a trial through one of those forums. And the third is telephone. I hate to say, I know that the patent for the telephone was I think in 1876, uh, but the court is still uh, adapting to that to use uh, telephone appearances for people uh, as an alternative to in-person uh, appearances. So we've had a long way to go. The pandemic has really caused courts to think of it court attendance in a different way and use the tools that are available to them. Um, I just wanted to touch base briefly in, in areas where we have had to change. Of course, the pandemic uh, was a, a situation where we simply could not have the numbers of people in our courtrooms that we were accustomed to having uh, because of the requirements for social distancing. Uh, it affected our ability to travel to remote circuit points because we were have we couldn't have court parties travel together in close proximity on planes in vans and in in vehicles uh, to to travel to the court points, uh, and it was a health hazard, health and safety hazard to be transporting um, prisoners to and from correctional facilities or police stations to the court and back. So. It was sudden and uh, we had to find ways to adapt. Um, on the civil side, we've usually made, used uh, uh, video platforms, WebEx to conduct case management conferences. And um, I guess to, to permit witnesses to testify at trials. Uh, on the criminal side, it's been broader than that. We've used um, uh, CCC, CCC TV or the video conferencing units more often um, to eliminate that transport between the correctional facilities and the police facilities and the courts. So we've been conducting bail hearings, uh, you know, more regularly by video. Uh, we've had to limit the numbers of dockets, both in custody and out of custody dockets. So again, video conferencing by the correct through the correctional centers. Or we've been asking um, people to provide telephone numbers for dockets and we were having to phone out uh, to each of those accused in a busy docket to connect with them and have a conference call it and conduct the court hearing that way. Um, we haven't done a lot of virtual trials uh, in their entirety, but uh, certainly I think judges have been more willing to permit 
virtual attendances of witnesses um, in, in many cases. Uh, you asked two questions, one about the benefits and one about uh, some of the challenges. Um, I think the main ben benefit to all of this is the convenience of not having to actually come to court. And that would include plaintiffs and defendants in civil actions, uh, lawyers and witnesses in all actions, and um, particularly the accused, uh, in custody accused. Transport's not an easy thing. Someone has to be, I think, searched before they leave the facility, searched when they get to court, and then searched when they get back to the facility. So it's convenient to people who are in custody not to have to go through that process to get to and from court for their hearings as well. Uh, the second thing I, I, is a cost reduction for people. Um, I can imagine that uh, uh, you know, the time it takes to participate in a court proceeding either, either as a witness or as a lawyer and the time that is saved by being able to do that virtually or by telephone from where you are. Um, it is also in some circumstances, I would say, you know, uh, reduce the cost of, of transport of the court party, although I think there's some drawbacks to that, but uh, uh, you know, to get to rem remote locations is very intensive. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of cost because it involves, again, flights and, and uh, ground travel to get to those locations and back. Uh, and the other thing, I think the main thing in terms of the temp pandemic is just timeliness and fewer adjournments. Like without um, having virtual um, adjudication, we wouldn't have been able to get things done. Uh, so this allowed us to actually continue with the with the business operations of the court during the pandemic. It's it also operates um, and helps assist the court outside of the pandemic, though, in terms of things like uh, weather outages, uh, where you couldn't travel to a court point because the weather was too bad to fly or to drive. With that video conferencing system, we're able to hold court. Uh, in situations where we otherwise would not have, have been able to do that. So I have the three benefits, the convenience, the cost reduction, and the timeliness, and, and resulting in fewer adjournments of, of matters. Uh, you did give me the two questions in one full gulp, so I'll just, I'll, I'll go on and just mention a few of the challenges. Um, I think it's, it, it, you know, keeping in mind that I'm, I'm the chief judge of the provincial court and we have other courts in the province, the Court of Queen's Bench and the Court of Appeal and our operations are very different. And uh, many of the people that we provide service to are from disadvantaged um, socioeconomic, come from socioeconomic disadvantagedly disadvantaged groups. They may not have access to technology. They may, they may, they may even be homeless. Um, so I think we have to remember that not everyone has access to technology. Uh, the provincial court operates in, I think, 13, 12 permanent court points and 53 circuit points. And in not all of those circuit points in some of the remote areas, there's not internet access. So it, 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 um, it you know, it, video conferencing may not be possible. Cell phone access is spotty. Uh, again, many people who appear before the provincial court do not have access to a computer or a, a telephone. Uh, and there's a wide range of comfort and ability when it comes to the use of technology. Um, many people uh, are not comfortable with the technology, so that provides some, some barriers. Uh, I think one of the other challenges is that court houses are frequently used as a meeting place for lawyers and their clients or between lawyers. Um, and uh, especially when for people who are represented by legal aid, they often use the courthouse as a place to meet and have conversations, um, uh, you know, before court. And that was kind of taken away uh, from them. In my view, um, effective communication is a, a key part of providing access to justice. Again, not only before between the lawyer and the client, but um, uh, between um, uh, you know, the, the, the people appearing in court need to felt heard and understood. Uh, the judge needs to feel like they're getting the information that they need to make a, an informed decision. And then the parties need to be able, the, the reasons need to be able to communicate it to people so that they understand uh, what is happening in, in, in court. And that can be challenging. Uh, you know, we're in a, an environment here in a Zoom call. The, the picture quality is clear. The sound is wonderful. Unfortunately, that's not always the experience we have with technology in provincial court. Uh, oftentimes we're dealing with telephone connections. 
Uh, it can be a telephone connection, speaking with someone at the correctional center. There may be banging in the background, a lot of noise and distractions happening in the background. So it really makes that communication difficult. Um, we may be having telephone communication with people from their own homes and there's lots of distractions happening in the homes. Um, you know, we'll have situations where there's a, maybe some, some children making noise in the background or things going on in the background it really interferes with that communication piece. Uh, another challenge is, is just making sure that we are always cognizant of the open court principle and which means that the public and the press have to have access to court proceedings and that when we're using technology, we have to um, consider that and make sure that that, that uh, access is provided. Uh, during the pandemic, when numbers were limited, I know that there were um, often family and friends who wanted to attend court in person and were not able to just because of the social distancing requirement. So we, in some instances, had to maybe limit the numbers in the courtroom um, again, it's maybe different when you're having a, a, a discrete hearing on a Zoom call where you can invite the people who wish to attend. It makes it more difficult, for example, when something's happening in a docket court uh, where you're making um, uh, those connections for each individual matter that's on, on the docket. Uh, and I, just the other thing, I think the challenge that we've had is, is a lot of what, uh, virtual court proceedings have caused extra pressure uh, as in some other part of the justice system. And we are a justice system and we need everyone, uh, all the stakeholders have to be able to work together to make it operate efficiently. So for example, when we have, um, uh, you know, people appear by video appearance in court, uh, it seems relatively easy from the court end, but in those, uh, whether it's a police station or a correctional facility, all of a sudden they're having to transport prisoners back and forth between a video room. They're having to handle paperwork that they're not used to handling. Um, it creates transport issues, perhaps. If you're having people appear you know, at a correctional center in Saskatoon who are resident in a Northern community and they're released on bail, then how do you get them back to their community? Whereas if they were appearing in person, they would have been transported in the morning and released in their community. So it's not without its um, complications. Uh, I think there's lots of um, good things that, that came of it and lots of things that were learned, but uh, also lots of challenges along the way. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn to Shannon Salter. Um, un unlike the Provincial Court of Saskatchewan, which uh, hadn't really thought they were going to have to do this on a large scale, um, your tribunal was really designed for for online adjudication. Um, but I wonder what, uh, whether the, the pandemic sort of caused you to, to think differently about the work of your tribunal and, and uh, what, how you see the, the benefits and challenges of that kind of proceeding. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Bilson. And uh, I also want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the West Coast on the traditional grounds of the Musqueam, uh, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh uh, Coast Salish peoples. And also a big thank you to Bria, who it's so lovely to see again for organizing this session. Um, yeah, the, the Civil Resolution Tribunal out here in BC, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, uh, isn't really focused on the adjudicative part of dispute resolution. We have tribunal members like me, about 17 of them full-time around the province who do adjudication, that's their full-time job. But the tribunal is really about trying to help people to resolve their disputes um, on their own if possible, and if not with the benefit of a mediator through negotiation and mediation. And so we use adjudication as a last resort, but it's not the center of our tribunal. So when I talk about uh, virtual or online adjudication, I'll, I'll talk about it a bit more broadly in terms of virtual dispute resolution. Um, our tribunal is a bit of a baby in the justice system. It only opened its doors in 2016. And we have been open continuously since then, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we were in a good position when the pandemic struck and we, we didn't skip a beat. Uh, we've been open continuously throughout. And, and that is a real advantage because I, I have so much sympathy for Chief Judge uh, Metivier and, and for courts around the world that had to really scramble to um, pivot just to be able to do the triage work to keep urgent matters being heard. And, 
and had to really scramble to adopt technology in kind of a, a tourniquet fashion is the way that I describe it. And I describe it that way because um, unlike the tribunal, which was sort of designed from the inception to be able to have a variety of community uh, communication methods to offer a lot of choice and flexibility, um, but that's not the way that our traditional justice system was designed. So it's a huge credit to the judiciary and court administrators of all of these systems um, to have been able to adapt so quickly to something that it took us years to do. Um, so what, some of the things that we did learn during the pandemic though were um, that certainly being online is an advantage. There's no doubt about that. We have a hundred staff and tribunal members around the province, 25 of whom our frontline staff were primarily in an office. It wasn't very difficult to bring them to work at home status because we're already paperless and the rest of the organization is online. What um, what I think had at least equal impact to already being online though, was having designed the tribunal um, in partnership with community legal advocates who represented the most vulnerable parties that we serve. And what I mean by that is that our development methodology requires that anytime we develop something that's public facing, whether it's rules, our, our hearing script we use for our hearings, our email communications, our web content, even our decisions, uh, we first of all make sure those are all written at a grade six reading level and we audit that through readability tools. Um, but anything that's public facing has to first be co-designed with community legal advocates around the province. And this is a roster of folks that we have who represent every kind of barrier you can imagine to accessing justice from you know, being a new arrival to Canada, not speaking English as a first language, um, folks with a low income, folks with housing insecurity, um, people with uh, physical disabilities, mental health issues, any kind of thing we can imagine as a barrier, we want them or their advocates participating in the design process. And then after we finished uh, doing that design work with them, we test with sort of everyday users of our tribunal, and then lastly with uh, lawyers and other justice stakeholders. And that doesn't sound like it's directly related to remote or online adjudication or dispute resolution, but what it's meant is that we've already built the tribunal to cater to the needs of people who have these barriers. So when the pandemic struck, we suddenly see, saw that so many more of us had mobility issues, couldn't leave the home for, for concerns about our health, um, had health challenges, maybe lost our job and had income insecurity. And so some of these barriers just really scaled up during the pandemic. And because we were already built to accommodate and offer choice and flexibility around those issues, then we were well positioned to be able to help um, folks who had difficulty. So because we weren't worried about pivoting to online, some of the things we did immediately, and this is, you know, early to mid-March 2020, was we um, press pause on issuing default decisions. Um, so we have jurisdiction over small claims disputes. Like any small claim court, a big percentage of those result in default decisions, particularly for things like payday loans. Um, we press pause on issuing any default decisions for a time to allow respondents to catch their breath and to be able to respond properly. Um, we also made it really easy for people to ask for extensions of time. All they had to do was send us an email with their dispute number, um, tell us that they were being affected by the pandemic and needed more time, and we just automatically did that. And then lastly, one of the other things we were able to do is we already have a really easy fee waiver process for people who have a low income. You basically click three buttons during the application phase and you immediately get a fee waiver. But that does depend on putting in your household income or indicating that you're on a government assistance program. Um, and we know for some people who had a sudden job loss, they maybe wouldn't be able to demonstrate this reduced income immediately. So we exercised our discretion to be more broad about um, what those financial eligibility requirements were. So all told, um, not having just to figure out how to keep operating allowed us to really focus on the needs of applicants and respondents and go that extra step to, to imagine what their lives might be like right now and create a lot of flexibility for them. Um, so in terms of the benefits and the, uh, the drawbacks, I think there are a lot of benefits to remote dispute resolution and not just remote adjudication. Um, the way I see online adjudication is that it is one tool in a very broad tool set that you can draw upon when you're using human-centered design. And of course, human-centered design is just really a, a buzzwordy way of saying that you put yourself in the shoes of the person who has to navigate any process, you recognize their expertise in their lives and experience, 
and you work closely with them to design your process to meet your objectives as an organization while giving people sort of dignity and choice and pathways and how they do that. So some of the benefits that we've heard about um, offering this choice and our choices, for example, include you know, online services, but also telephone services, um, in-person services before the pandemic and mail-based services as well, is that letting empowering people to choose how they go about things gives them a lot more confidence. It lets them find their comfort zone and it really reduces anxiety. Um, so Chief Judge uh, Metivier was talking about telephones and I, I, I you were talking about in, in a slightly sheepish way, but I think telephones are a great technology and they're a great tool. Um, oftentimes they're the lowest common technological denominator between two different parties with different resources. So we do a lot of our mediations through telephone mediation. Um, forcing people in an online process, whether it's an online application form or any other online process, is really counterproductive when you can just pick up the phone and ask them a question. So again, it's really about picking the right tool for the person given their need. That's one of the huge advantages of offering online as one of those tools, because for most of it, us, it's a very convenient technology. And then there's other people for whom mail or telephone is gonna work a lot better or even in person. One of the advantages of working with advocates is we've been able to identify that using some of these tools in a careful way has really increased their access to justice. So for example, we work really closely with the Disability Alliance of BC um, on our processes and, and they've reported back that having the option to engage in an online hearing has a lot of benefits, not surprisingly for a lot of their clients, right? Um, people who can engage from an environment like a home office or even a, a, a table or any other space in their home that's already accommodated to, for example, physical disabilities from a computer that's already got adaptive technology on it. Um, and also for people who um, are experiencing mental health issues, it can often reduce the anxiety to be able to participate from a familiar environment that doesn't require you to have, have to travel down to a courthouse and deal with the anxiety of, of feeling like a fish out of water. Um, and I think that's probably true for lots of folks, whether or not um, they need particular accommodations. We know that it can be a stressful experience to navigate the court system. So those are a lot of the advantages. Um, Chief Justice Judge uh, Metivier has mentioned some of the other ones, um, not having to necessarily arrange childcare if that's not possible for you. Um, having asynchronous dispute resolution means people don't have to take time off work. We found um, asynchronous mediation, which means that people can go back and forth by email, has also increased settlement rates in some ways where people don't have the hot climate of having to see the other person that they may have negative feelings about. Um, they have the chance to sleep on a, a proposed settlement proposal, maybe talk to a spouse or a family member, and it's operated very well in terms of reducing the temperature, which is always good in an adversarial context. There are certainly some drawbacks. We, like Saskatchewan, British Columbia has a lot of remote areas and concentrated urban centers, and that cuts both ways. For a lot of folks in these remote communities, getting down to a courthouse uh, was very difficult even before the pandemic. Um, courthouses are not necessarily accessible in all of these remote communities, but then neither is high-speed internet sometimes. And so that's where I think it's important to build out partnerships. And we'll talk about some of these strategies later, but to build out uh, partnerships with local advocates, with local public libraries, community centers, and places where people can connect to both the humans and the facilities that can help them. But it is also about offering them other ways of um, accessing services and then constantly checking back to see if you've done that. Um, one of the things that we've been doing since the beginning is we have participant satisfaction surveys. So people who have gone through our process are asked what they think of it. They're not asked what they think about our decisions. Usually half of the folks wouldn't be too happy and the other half would be pleased. And that's a question for the court on appeal. Um, but we do wanna know people's subjective view of things like fairness, um, understandability, time to resolution, whether our staff treated them with respect and, and kindness. So um, we get pretty high scores on all of those things, but the comments also help us identify areas where we're, we're missing the mark as well. And uh, don't get me wrong, we make tons of mistakes all the time, but constantly asking for this feedback helps us to identify them quickly, hopefully, and, and court correct. So I think I'll leave it there at the risk of <laughs> prattling on for far too long and, and allow uh, Daniel to have some airspace too. Thanks, Shannon. Um, so I'll turn to uh, Dan Shapiro and uh, ask you to uh, tell us a bit about your experience during the pandemic and 
and what you found to be the, the benefits and challenges of working in a virtual or online environment. Thank you uh, very much, Beth. And thank you as well to uh, Ria for playing such a key role in organizing this event. It's really uh, a great honor for me to be part of uh, Access to Justice Week and uh, especially on such an illustrious panel as this. Um, so um, I, I, I'll talk a little bit about uh, my vantage point when the pandemic was declared, which is, um, which is a little different than um, the vantage point of uh, Chief Judge Mativier and, and Shannon Salter. Um, I was a chief adjudicator of the Indian Residential Schools Adjudication Secretariat, which was a, a national tribunal to resolve <clears throat> um, claims of um, historic uh, childhood sexual and physical abuse. And we had been set up to deal with um, approximately 12,000 claims. In the end, we ended up with uh, over 38,000 claims. And the settlement agreement that the courts in nine jurisdictions um, um, entrusted to us to administer um, called for in-person hearings. And we ended up with uh, tens of thousands of in-person hearings. At our peak, we had um, 110 adjudicators. We had staff of uh, 275 people in four cities throughout the country. And I think we were the largest travel agency in the country because for every, every hearing, um, we, our staff organized travel for, for claimants, for survivors of residential schools and supporters, elders, um, cultural workers, uh, health support workers, uh, adjudicators um, and, and so forth. So it was um, really a, a massive project and the settlement agreement that we were administering did call for in-person hearings. So um, <clears throat> that it had the pandemic struck when we were in full flight, which was uh, at which point we were doing about 4,500 hearings, in-person hearings a year from coast to coast to coast. I'm not sure how we would have managed that. As it turns out, it was, um, um, it was close to the end of our mandate. We did have one school, a residential school that had been in litigation for years as to whether it would qualify for the settlement agreement. And ultimately it was added very late in the day. So we had a, a small number of claims from a school, but it was a school in Nunavut um, it came, that came very late in the day after the pandemic was declared. Um, and I had um, um, sent all of our staff home and, uh, and uh, uh, directed that there be no further travel long before the, the federal government did. Uh, as, as a precaution. So we did, we were faced with having to deal with a small number of claims in, a, um, <clears throat> in an environment where there wasn't much um, access to technology in terms of commuters, uh, computers and, and bandwidth and so forth. And we simply, we tried to do um, some in-person, not in-person, but virtual hearings using video and just found that the connectivity and access to computers was not sufficient. We ended up in the end doing probably the last half a dozen claims um, by, by telephone. And uh, it was a challenge in terms of providing uh, for translation and uh, cultural and health supports for vulnerable people. Um, but our, our mandate was coming to an end by virtue of a court order. And so people were faced with, uh, you know, they, there was no ability really to wait until after the pandemic. So the, the telephone hearing um, had turned out to be a successful vehicle. Uh, my colleagues have spoken about it and uh, it was very effective uh, because most people had access to a cell phone or a community telephone that they could access even though they may not have had computer access. So that was one world that I was uh, working in. And the other one was um, the arb arbitration world. And that world was quite, um, everything came to a halt as of March of last year. Um, and people were thinking, well, this will just be a couple of months. Look what happened at Wuhan. They were back, uh, back functioning fairly normally after two months. So if we adjourn all our cases for two months, we should be good to go. And of course, most of the cases were adjourned for five or six months and uh, went absolutely nowhere because we weren't able to safely 
uh, offer in-person hearings uh, even six months later. So we lost six months of, um, of um, adjudication time for people. And ultimately, uh, when we started to, um, and it was the, some of the lawyers were, were gung-ho to conduct virtual hearings and many were very resistant to it. But ultimately uh, things had ground to a halt and had we not been able to proceed with virtual hearings, um, many people who were waiting for in-person administrative hearings that could be held safely would still be waiting, um, especially in Saskatchewan had virtual hearings not been uh, available. So um, that has been something that has been successful and also uh, in minimizing not just the stress to individuals associated with having claims unresolved for a long period, but to institutions. So in a, in a labor relations setting uh, for both employers and unions, having <clears throat> grievances pile up and be remain unresolved in a workplace over a long period of time can have serious institutional consequences. And so once we started to get into the swing of virtual hearings, and overcoming some of the initial resistance, um, it has been a huge benefit in that in that way. And my my uh, colleagues have spoken about benefits in terms of travel costs and so forth. But even in terms of um, witnesses, expert witnesses, uh, rather than showing up in a hearing room or a courtroom and potentially waiting for a day or longer for their testimony, it's a simple matter of sending them a text and saying. We're ready for you and can bring you into the hearing virtually. Um, but, you know, the main thing was the ability to offer a hearing that was 100% safe for people. And that is a, that is a huge benefit. Um, and um, it's not just the safety of it. Um, uh, there are some people for whom, you know, medical problems. Um, I recently presided over a, a, a claim by an individual who was undergoing chemotherapy and radiation therapy and uh, would not have been able to travel to a larger center for a hearing and was able to participate in the hearing by phone to take whatever breaks she needed uh, during the hearing um, in her own living room. Um, and uh, that was a, a, a huge benefit. And um, and uh, so it, it removed what may have been an insurmountable barrier to justice for her that would have been associated with travel to a major center to have an in-person hearing. Um, another benefit that we are starting to see is an expanding pool of adjudicators uh, that is available to litigants, um, which have usually been restricted to geographical uh, boundaries in terms of accessing justice, but that's no longer the case. If people want to ac access specialized expertise, that's available in other provinces or in some cases in other countries. Um, so I, I think that um, those are there are numerous benefits and that virtual hearings, um, especially in Saskatchewan, uh, are here to stay. Um, and um, no, though not exclusively. And I think um, both of my co-panelists have mentioned the need to consult with, with participants in terms of system design. And, and I think that's so important. Um, in the residential school settlement, the parties chose their adjudicators, um, but through the stakeholders, a unanimous vote of all of the stakeholders, uh, including church organizations, government, uh, plaintiff organizations, <clears throat> And um, and uh, indigenous organizations, and that was that was a huge uh, um, uh, benefit that was won to them in the settlement because of historic distrust that they had, frankly, in the in the um, in the Western legal system, and so the so the the chance to select their adjudicators was a huge um, benefit to them. They um, and they they continue to have access to their representatives throughout the process to provide guidance and support and advice uh, to me as, as chief adjudicator and to my adjudicators. Um, and that was, that was a huge benefit. So we could assess how things were going, make systems improvements as we went along and gather input from the stakeholders and the participants as to what was working well and what could work better. Um, so there are things like that that wouldn't, uh, necessarily work in a provincial court 
setting. Um, and in our process, they couldn't select the actual adjudicators for their hearing, but they could select from a pool of adjudicators from whom their cases would be, would be heard. So um, there are huge benefits to it. Um, at the same time, um, and my colleagues have spoken very eloquently about this, there, there are challenges for sure. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of uh, individuals with literacy issues and uh, those who are, um, who are uh, unrepresented, I use that term deliberately versus self-represented, um, but those who are unrepresented have significant challenges accessing justice. Um, language can be a barrier, cultural barriers, um, and historic distrust of Western legal systems can all be barriers. And so um, I think the virtual hearing can, can offer some um, access that wouldn't have been available to people uh, otherwise. And right now, because of connectivity and limited access to computers, and uh, Shannon Salter spoke of this and I couldn't agree more. Um, I think the challenge is to try to find <clears throat> Uh, trusted intermediaries that can provide assistance with access to the technology. Um, she spoke about, um, about libraries. So I would also add to that um, band council offices, nursing stations, government offices, um, and so forth, where there are individuals available that could assist with technology and also um, help to uh, drive um, unrepresented people into the arms of, of lawyers who can assist them. Um, so I think, I think um, you know, there are challenges certainly with, uh, with using virtual platforms. If you're dealing with vulnerable litigants, um, it is more challenging to establish a relationship of trust. And in our Indian residential school hearings, um, I think the, the, the prevailing wisdom was that if we didn't establish some form of connection of trust with individuals in the first 10 minutes, we never would. And so that is more challenging to do in a virtual environment. There are ways of addressing that through communication, pre-hearing communication, having a call, or if it's a Zoom call, um, a Zoom hearing or other virtual hearing, uh, having a practice session a few days before or a week beforehand uh, so people can get used to the process, try to gain some trust in the technology and some um, comfort level with the people that they will be appearing before and who will be questioning them in the hearing. Um, and so that, that, that does call for special communication skills. And I think decision makers um, communication skills will be increasingly important um, because uh, the days of showing up uh, in court and that's the first time you have any connection with the decision maker, I think those are largely behind us. Um, so um, I think people will, will expect to have some form of uh, contact with people beforehand to increase their comfort level, both with the platforms and, and the participants. Um, there are challenges with virtual hearings in terms of documents. Um, it's, it's one that can be overcome. Um, so, you know, a sophisticated litigant or lawyers would be able to be, have some comfort dealing with documents electronically. A self-represented individual would need to get uh, the paperwork, papers, um, uh, hard copies sent to them before the hearing so they would have a full set of materials uh, to, to work from. Um, and so the tribunal needs to be sensitive to that and the participants need to be prepared enough in advance to offer that because the days of putting documents in at the hearing um, with unrepresented people are probably, probably limited. So on, on balance, um, I, I think the virtual hearing is here to stay. It still does offer a 100% safe vehicle for resolving disputes. Um, I can acknowledge that wouldn't really be effective in provincial court or in docket court where you have maybe hundreds of cases in the same, same day. But in terms of running hearings, um, I think this is something that is here to stay. And the challenge is to make it um, user friendly, to continually reassess um, what's working and to try to identify best practices and to make changes 
as needed with the benefit of input of the of the users of the system. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. So I uh, want to push a little further with with some of uh, Dan's comments. Um, I, I think I think his one of his final comments, which was that virtual hearings are here to stay. Um, you know, I think represents a, a fairly widespread view. That is that that um, although it certainly took um, some justice institutions a long time to uh, make widespread use of, of technology uh, in their in their either their dispute resolution procedures or their adjudication, um, the 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 pandemic certainly forced a a great leap forward in that respect, and and uh, people did find that that it was possible to um, have certain kinds of proceedings with the aid of, of technology. Um, but I, I and and on that assumption, that is based on the assumption that there will be um, some component of proceedings in various uh, forums that will continue to be in virtual form. Um, I'd be interested to hear you talk a bit about, um, about what you think is necessary in terms of, of training for adjudicators or, or their staff, uh, or, or what kinds of supports you think are necessary to, um, to make those, uh, those proceedings, um, make those proceedings sound legal proceedings. Um, I think to, to go back to Chief Judge Metibier's um, discussion, uh, her one of the things she suggested was that, that there was a, a bit of uh, sort of trial and error and, and scrambling involved to, to produce uh, some form of, of legal proceeding under the circumstances, but I think um, I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say about what it would take to to support those proceedings and provide sort of highly trained um, people to to support them. I know Shannon Salter, and I'll I'll call on you first. I know you suggested some things that your tribunal already uh, already does in that respect, but I wonder if you have anything to add. Um, on that point. Uh, certainly, and I think um, it really does come down to this sort of uh, cultural value of putting the participants and accommodating their needs as the, the central plank in your process. Obviously, as, as lawyers and tribunal members and judges, we have a mandate to discharge, we have a job to do, um, and we have certain guardrails and objectives that we need to meet, primarily the rule of law. So we're certainly the experts in that, but there are lots of different ways to get to those objectives or to meet those goalposts in a way that's procedurally fair and legally sound. And it doesn't need to look the way it does now. And I think where, in my experience in um, talking to courts around the world about this issue, where the trouble is, is that you have a system that was not designed using human-centered design and, um, really relies on bricks and mortar and a very specific way of doing things. And then the pandemic came and it met this technology that really disrupted that. Um, so it's really putting a, a round peg in a square hole and you always get those two mixed up. Instead, I think we are at a bit of an inflection point where we have to decide, we can keep trying to retrofit a, a justice system that hasn't really adapted in many ways to modern life um, and just sort of slap a Zoom hearing on top of it or we can do what we really need to do, which is going back to the tourniquet metaphor, the surgery on the underlying wound. And the underlying wound is the access to justice crisis that well predated the pandemic. And tackling that means really starting from basic principles and re-examining and redesigning every single process that we do in the justice system. Now that's not a very appetizing thought, um, especially for folks who are rightly burnt out and exhausted because you have you know, a judiciary and court administrators and government and lawyers and everybody's just trying to hold on to their hats and get through this. Um, but really if we want to uh, tackle the underlying problem it's gonna require a, a complete system redesign. And to your question about what that looks like in 
when you are really focusing on the needs of the participant, well, it starts well before the online adjudication. Um, and, and one of the ways that we try to identify where people need supports is on the application form. We ask them, um, do you need any special accommodation? We have a checklist there. Um, do, you, do you have difficulty reading or writing in English? Um, do you, you know, do you have a visual or, or hearing impediment? Do you have impairment rather? Um, do you have, need an interpreter? Do you have a mental health issues? Or just a blank box, is there any other thing that may get in the way of you being able to participate fully in this process? And so one of our staff members will contact parties who indicate that they need accommodation and figure out an accommodation plan. That sounds really resource intensive, but it's not really surprisingly because a lot of times we can accommodate those needs. If, if somebody, for example, um, has a visual impairment, we may rely less on written material. We may go straight to those telephone um, hearings or mediations, and, and it may be something completely different for somebody with a different need. Oftentimes, those, those needs can be accommodated, um, and it helps to identify them as early as possible and not waiting until you have that adjudication to discover that, you know, Zoom's not going to work very well because the person doesn't have internet or they um, have other uh, difficulties that need to be accommodated. So that early intervention is really key and then that can inform the entire process. In our experience, it also really increases trust, which is something that uh, Daniel was talking about. It, it makes people think that we are interested in evening the playing field, that we acknowledge that not everybody comes to the justice system from the same background or place. And even if we can't do everything for them to accommodate their needs, at least being curious, asking, um, kind of centering that conversation has really reduced anxiety and increased trust. So that's one thing. And then in terms of how you train your staff or your, your tribunal members or judges, a, a lot of it is those, those softer skills. So um, all of our tribunal members have to do an eight hour trauma informed practice course, which also talks about um, the tangentially anyway, trauma informed judging. Um, so that we make sure we're, we're not causing further harm wherever we can avoid that. They also do a minimum of 12 hours of um, first Indigenous cultural competency training, but then all their extended training. They all have to do training in um, mental, serving the needs of people with mental health issues so that they can communicate in ways that and accommodate in ways that um, people are more likely to be able to absorb and understand and, and respond to. And there's lots of other training too, plain language training. We do oral, virtual oral hearing um, training with all of our members. And a lot of that is focused on getting to know the technology, knowing the platform, but it's also about navigating issues that can arise in an online context that are maybe less likely to arise in an in-person context. Um, what happens where you have three people and two of them are, are witnesses and they're all in the same household? How do you exclude witnesses? How do you deal with interruptions? Um, like children or pets? How do you deal with parties who interrupt each other? How do you maintain gravitas um, while keeping the temperature cool and still maintaining a, a friendly atmosphere so that people aren't too anxious to give you the information you need as a decision maker? So a lot of that takes practice, training, um, but we also, you know, my own perspective is that the problem is not that online adjudication is too informal. You saw a lot of directives coming from different courts at the beginning of the pandemic, admonishing people not to um, have children to interrupt or, or, you know, dressing appropriately. And of course, all of those things are important, but um, I don't think that the justice system suffers from a lack of formality. Um, in my experience, it's quite the opposite. People get very nervous. They, they're very concerned. Um, that can be paralyzing and can impair their ability to communicate. And so the sweet spot for tribunal members is figuring out how to maintain respect, um, gravitas and enough order that people can be fairly heard and understand what's, what's happening. Um, and at the same time, offer enough flexibility and kind of compassion that uh, people are, are also not inadvertently um, excluded. So our tribunal members are trained that if, uh, and of course they're independent, but this is general training we provide, is that if a child interrupts, you ignore it. Unless there's unless there's a disruption, in which case then you you know smile and ask the person if they need five minutes to to deal and come back later. It is not really treated as um, a terribly serious thing unless it interferes with the, the fairness of the hearing. So um, that's been our approach, and I think a lot of it does come down to training and, and understanding the liberalities of the people who come before us, and that uh, everybody's sort of struggling, um, doing their very best, and it's our job to make sure that the process is fair, but also that it's accessible. 
So um, I will just say as a, a closing thing too that it's it's sometimes the case that online hearings are not the best tool for the job, and I fully acknowledge that. Um, for the kinds of disputes that we have, they're often the right tool, but the vast majority of our disputes are resolved through written materials. Um, and all, kind of shockingly to date, nobody has actually asked for an online hearing. Um, we sometimes think, I think as lawyers and judges, that what people want is their day in court, they wanna get in front of the judge, they wanna have their trial. Um, I don't know if that's the case. I certainly haven't seen a lot of evidence uh, to support that. I think it is the case that people want their dispute resolved and they want it done fairly and quickly and inexpensively. Um, but offering people the option of having a written hearing um, offers some advantages for people who do have children or would have to take time on work off work even for a virtual hearing. Um, and it also allows people who may have difficulty uh, communicating in, per in a sort of real time way due to anxiety or literacy issues to take that time to write out their story or their submissions, to have somebody else take a look at it, to get legal advice um, and to come back if necessary. We also do have free telephone interpretation in over 200 languages. So we bring in interpreters if that's necessary, but again, offering people as much choice and flexibility as possible um, for us has been really key to navigating some of these barriers that can arise. Thanks. Um, Shannon Metivier, I wonder if you could talk a bit about what, what you would see as the, um, the training needs for, for members of your court and, and staff if they're going to participate in, in virtual proceedings of various kinds and, and what other supports you think would be necessary to, the, to make the process uh, function optimally. On the training and supports, I, I, I echo what Shannon uh, uh, Salter had said about uh, in terms of uh, training communication wise is really important how you how you adjudicate an online hearing or, or participate in that might be different than an in person attend attendance. And the other really about the process about how do you handle documents and exhibits and so on. Um, I guess I also want to just echo the the comments made by my my uh, fellow panelists about um, you know, virtual adjudication or, or virtual processes are really a tool and they're not an answer to everything, but it's another tool in the toolbox uh, to better serve the public in the end. And so you're always asking that question, am I using it uh, for, to improve the administration of justice or I'm just using it because it's there. And uh, so just always to be cognizant of that. I might be a bit of a dinosaur because I still think that buildings matter. Uh, locations matter. I think that they're part of um, uh, the culture, part of our society. Uh, you know, I think of universities, churches, courts, and, and we've had, hopefully moving forward, there'll be more inclusive buildings, more inclusive of cultural interests uh, in, in a forward way. But to have that uh, place where people come uh, to deal with their matters in certain circumstances, I think is, is still important. There are, I think, distinctions between, and we have, you know, for provincial court, we have a civil component and a criminal component. And I think that there's differences between the two. Um, and in some instances, you know, we're talking about online platforms uh, serving the public. It's, 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 it's contrary to what we've been trying to accomplish in some other areas in the criminal justice system about therapeutic courts, where the idea is to get more personally involved with people, get them connected uh, in person to, um, uh, supports in their community. They come to court and see court more um, as a partner in their rehabilitation and their journey than just a, a decision maker at the end. So, you know, we've been trying to accomplish that with some of our therapeutic court processes. And then, um, uh, so I, I guess I just want to say a bit of a dinosaur. I like buildings and I still think personal connection is important, but I would echo what my, what my fellow panelists said in, in that really it's a tool and we just need to use it consciously, consciously and uh, uh, in a positive way. Thanks. Uh, Dan, do you have anything to add about um, the kinds of, of supports that you think would be necessary for people participating in, in um, virtual proceedings or, or um, what kind of training you think uh, adjudicators and staff require? Uh, just a few things. I think my colleagues covered this point very well, but uh, the one, the couple of points I might just add 
Um, when we were dealing with the Indian Residential School Secretary, there was a lot of training in cultural competencies. We had uh, psychologists and we also had elders come to speak to us, um, our adjudicators. And in fact, um, in one of our, our adjudicator meetings, we ended up with a three-day meeting with an elders lodge that was held in this hotel where there was a female elder and a male elder. And um, the first day of our training uh, session, it was mainly our um, Indigenous colleagues that were going in to, to use or use the services of the elders. By the second day, it was about 95% non-Indigenous. And by the third day, the Indigenous adjudicators couldn't even get into the elders lodge. There were, there were such a, uh, an interest and enthusiasm about embracing that sort of advice and, and assistance and, and knowledge. So um, that is a challenge to try to replicate in a, in a virtual world for sure. Uh, however, um, there is this, I think, overriding obligation on decision makers to try to find out what it is that is making people tick and what it is they will need to have a, a safe, respectful hearing uh, so that regardless of the legal outcome, they feel that um, they have confidence in the process and they can respect the decision that's being arrived at. So that requires, you know, open-mindedness, flexibility. Um, we might be looking at, you know, what, especially for the, for the uh, unrepresented, do they need family members uh, as supporters for their hearing, interpreters, elders? Uh, do they want some form of ceremony? Uh, to start their or end their proceedings? Um, do they want a special form of acknowledgement of their um, affirmation on a sacred object? All of these things that will uh, put a person at ease or have the potential to. Um, the other thing is just in terms of, um, I still think that going to people, one of the things we did in our tribunal when we were able to safely travel is we would go wherever we were asked to go by the survivors. So it could be we had many hearings in uh, people's homes and nursing, nursing homes in hospitals in, um, in corrections facilities. And, and the hearings in people's homes were really some of the best hearings we had, where you would people would show the photographs of their children and grandchildren. And that would be kind of a wonderful way to get the discussion started. Um, and um, they the fact, and I had one person after another tell me they never thought they were important enough that someone would come to them and they would hear from a government lawyer, a church representative and an adjudicator that would come to them. And so much as I agree with, uh, with Chief, uh, Chief Judge Metivier that it's, it's great to try to aim to have our buildings uh, made more welcoming and inclusive, there is historic distrust there that can be overcome to some large extent by putting people at the center of the process and not having the decision maker uh, in a setting that causes uh, distrust uh, where, where that's possible. But again, you, you, you listen to people, you hear what they have to say and you make adjustments to your process. I, I do wanna pick up on one thing also that Shannon Salter said um, which was talking about uh, decisions based on written materials. And this is a huge um, question that I think people that are concerned with justice will be considering more and more in the, in the current context. Um, when, we, when the settlement agreement was set up for the residential school system, it was shortly after the Kaufman inquiry in Nova Scotia in relation to abuse claims for this. Um, there's a Nova Scotia school for boys and a separate school for girls. And there was some suggestion there that the, um, the abuse claims were, um, were just paid out without any validation or confirmation. And that led to the requirement in our settlement agreement for validation of claims. Um, and that was something that was also picked up in the hepatitis C class action settlement. Um, so that was the, sort of the cornerstone of it, that in order for the public to have confidence that they would need to have the ability to confirm that the person was, their, their testimony was challenged and tested on cross-examination and so forth. But in recent years, uh, in the class action settlement, at least uh, mainly involving the government, there has been a dramatic shift away from um, settlements that involve in-person hearings. And by that, I refer to um, 
the 60 scoop settlement, the um, day school settlement, uh, the settlements involving harassment in the military and the RCMP, um, all of those have basically done away with in-person hearings. And the way they have done that is um, to establish presumptions of credibility and reliability. And there are some audit mechanisms that are built, built into each of them, but the default is um, they're go it's going to be um, decisions based on written materials. And so, but again, it's not a one size fits all solution. For some participants, some litigants, the um, ability to have their testimony heard and validated is of really paramount importance. And for others, uh, it may be um, swift and speedy justice. And, um, and, um, and so there isn't a one size fits all solution, but I think the comments are very well taken in terms of being open to a decision-making process that doesn't require in-person hearings. So whether that trend in class actions uh, does um, uh, permeate other areas of the law remains to be seen. But the government that's settling these claims is certainly no longer insisting on individual validation. And maybe that's because of the, uh, in part because of the, the Indian residential school process where they weren't expecting 38,000 claims and the amount of time it would take to deal with them. So whether the parties would have chosen that type of system had they known then what they know now is very much an open question. So I just raised this issue of these trends and that is another, another option or tool that can be explored uh, in terms of a written decision. I wonder if we could, could turn now to, um, to the question that uh, Shannon Salter has raised about uh, sort of human-centered design. Um, and I'll start by asking you, Shannon, if you could um, elaborate a bit more on, on what you mean by that and, and what um, and, and what you think uh, what you think the objectives of it are and, and what the benefits of it are to the kind of processes that you've been describing. I'm sorry, that was about human-centered design. It just cut out for just a moment. Uh, that's right. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, yeah, and you know, when we were designing the tribunal before it opened in 2016, that wasn't really a term that was used very much, but what we were kind of given was this statutory blank slate in some ways. There wasn't really another example to follow, at least in terms of integration with the public system. And so we naturally went out to try to find what empirical evidence existed out there about how the civil justice system was working or not. And what we found were a lot of reports, but not a lot of data. Um, and so we had to either create that data by doing our own surveys or research, creating focus groups, or try to extrapolate from other fields like mediation and import that information in. And so we developed a kind of a testing methodology that um, at first we got completely backwards because we um, started at first, we, we designed something like a form and then we test it with a whole group of, of lawyers first. And then we'd work our way through to everyday people and then people who had barriers. And um, that just doesn't work at all. And so, so now when I am asked to talk to other courts around the world that are looking to pilot online dispute resolution, typically the first thing they do is put together an advisory board for their pilot project. And invariably, this uh, advisory board will have lawyers, judges, court administrators, and will not have community advocates, self-represented people, health specialists, uh, social workers, um, mediators, and others. And so often the first thing I'll say, and this isn't very popular, is that they need to disband their advisory board <laughs> and come up with a new one. And the reason I say that is because human-centered design is really not something that you can do by um, kind of extrapolating from your own experience as an expert and then creating what you imagine would serve the needs of other populations. But we started that way and it, it was very bad. Um, everything we designed was terrible and we found out the hard way by testing it with everyday people. Now the good news is we did that pretty rapidly and then flipped our methodology on the head. Um, so if you, if you start with um, you know, the, the people who are already operating in the system and, and understand the system, what you end up with is something that's pretty similar to what you already have. Um, if you design with a blank slate, prioritizing people who have the most difficulty and the most challenges, 
and getting them to help you design it, you end up with just a completely different creature. Um, and that's the really exciting, but also really difficult part of human-centered design. Um, you know, get asked a lot, what was the hardest part of designing the CRT? And it really wasn't the technology. I mean, the technology we use is not blockchain or, or AI for the most part. It, mainly the tribunal runs on Microsoft 3, 365 and, you know, an online forum or two. Um, but it is the culture and, and it's a culture that is nobody's fault because, um, you know, we're all part of it and, and it's the way we're educated as lawyers and it's the way we operate. And, you know, the, the sector is full of incredibly good hearted people who want to do right by the public, but it's really difficult when you're in that system to see beyond it. It's a phenomenon called system blindness. So the way around that is to um, say, okay, well, we're, we're experts in the law, but people are experts in their lived life. And we have to be humble and curious and listen and attentive and go out and, and talk to people and also take our lumps when they tell us uh, that whatever we've made is, is terrible and no good. So um, that's the way we've approached this. And it, it, it includes things like test, having this rigorous testing methodology for anything that's public facing, but it um, also means that when people go through the process, we're asking them on the other side, uh, what they think of the whole process as well. So um, that can be also humbling and kind of daunting for courts and tribunals to have to uh, you know, publish the statistics about all of that. Um, but it has meant that we're pretty, you know, open to criticism and feedback. We get lots of it and we try to action it pretty rapidly. Um, but, you know, you, I could, could do a whole other hour on how you can do all of this with almost no budget. Um, I have a, a whole shtick I do on user testing and human-centered design on a shoestring because most public bodies don't have a budget for, you know, a UX designer and an expensive consulting firm to do it. You can do a lot of this, even if you have no technology, by taking a clipboard and a form and going into the lineup in your court registry and talking to people about their experience, how they got there, what they're trying to do, who helped them, how much it's cost, how long it's taken, what they're trying to achieve, have them fill out your form and watch them stumble and figure out where you need to change it. So it really is about uh, kind of a philosophy. And, um, and I think it, it is really exciting. And I think we're at this kind of inflection point again at the pandemic where we can choose to settle for putting a Zoom interface on processes which haven't fundamentally changed for decades, if not hundreds of years. Or we can say, we can change, there's some exciting tools we can use, but it's gonna require us to really dig deep and ask ourselves, what is the evidentiary basis for every single thing that we do in the justice system? Why do we do it that way? Is it just because we always have, because somebody came up with it 50 years ago and we haven't really tested it? Um, is it still meeting the objectives that we, we think we're meeting? How do we know it is? And if the answer to all of that is we don't know, then it's a sign to go out and, and get some data and just think very openly about how we can change all of these processes. Thanks. So uh, Shannon Metevier, um, I wonder if you have had any experience with this approach or if you have any thoughts about its potential in your institution? I'm not even going to pretend to be an expert having uh, listened to Shannon talk about it. My experience is limited to what I heard today and some uh, a few conversations I've had with uh, Bree because she's uh, kind enough to take time to talk to me uh, once in a while. I didn't have a whole lot um, uh, to say under that topic, but I'm, I'm, I'm just glad I didn't totally miss the point because I said talk to humans and it seems like that's a part of it. So I feel, I'm feeling pretty, pretty proud of myself for uh, uh, at least uh, getting some of it right. <laughs> <laughs> Good. This is a perfect summary. <laughs> you only had five words. Three words. Um, so, so Dan, do you have any comments on that approach? Well, I, I don't think we could argue with uh, the need to speak to humans. I think that's always good advice to bear in mind. Um, but I, I, again, I, I think if we if we look at some of the things that that can be done. Um, to enhance the public confidence in the in the decision making process and the decision makers in the design of the system, that will always be to the benefit of the system, and it will improve the outcome. Um, I think, you know, if you look at involving people in the process itself, what is it they're looking for? That rather than imposing it from on high, that will always produce a better outcome. Um, I think also one of the, among the things that can be done to enhance 
uh, the confidence in the public and the tribunals that are hearing their cases would be and uh, wouldn't be possible in all cases, but in some, um, and we did this as well in the residential schools work, we would have the, um, the, the stakeholders were involved right from the beginning in terms of the design of the system, the creation and negotiation of the settlement agreement, what kind of a process they wanted, and then the ongoing monitoring of how the settlement was unfolding and the ability to make, make changes. To me, that was, that was huge. And there's no reason on paper why that should work. If you have government lawyers, church lawyers, uh, claimant lawyers, indigenous association uh, or uh, organization lawyers, why that should work. But uh, it did work. It did work because people were determined to, to make the system work. Uh, we also um, involved the stakeholders. And I think that's something that can be done in other systems. So not only in the selection uh, of the adjudicators, but the training of them so that they would participate in the training and um, have an opportunity to see uh, how the adjudicators were being trained, how their, their, uh, their roles were being shaped uh, and to enhance their confidence in the process. And then in an ongoing way to monitor how things are going, um, to select in some cases, the expert witnesses that they would use um, rather than having uh, kind of a hired gun approach with uh, each party ca calling their own expert witnesses. There'd be one panel of um, uh, medical experts or psychological experts from whom uh, the adjudicator would select the person and retain them and so forth. So those are the kinds of things that I think can make a real difference um, and could be, could be used in other processes, I think, quite, quite effectively. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I just want to um, pick up on a question that one of our participants has a asked, and I think, Dan, you're probably the person to refer this to. I'm always hesitant to re refer a question to a judge that may involve some speculation about, a, about this kind of issue, which is um, what there is one of the criticisms that has been made or the, the possible criticisms of virtual proceedings is that it's difficult to determine the credibility of witnesses in that sort of format. And I just wondered if you have a 30 second response to that kind of criticism. This is something we heard over and over again early on, especially in the labor relations cases, um, where one of the participants didn't want to have a case to proceed because they thought they needed to be able to test the credibility and reliability of the person um, in person and look them in the eyes and so forth. But I think that is really um, an overblown concern. And I think it has been allayed over the course of the pandemic uh, by a lot of the people who were doubtful of that to begin with. And the reason for that is simply this, the, the court cases, um, all of the court cases from the Supreme Court of Canada down have indicated that um, the demeanor of a witness is the least reliable indicator of credibility and reliability. And particularly in an increasingly, you know, um, diverse uh, country with all sorts of linguistic and cultural backgrounds to try to draw conclusions on individuals responses and apply those in terms of their facial expressions or um, their responses to questions. Um, is no longer valid. There, I, I just don't think that's that's has any validity at all. There are ways that can, uh, and most decision makers would look at reliability as being the major issue. And there are all sorts of abilities, if necessary, to test reliability against um, consistency, whether internal in, in, uh, consistency of the witness's testimony or external inconsistency with known facts or known documents. Uh, those are the more reliable ways. And there are, um, for example, in my virtual hearings, I circulate guidelines to try to minimize credibility and reliability concerns in terms of uh, establishing that there won't be any other person in the, in the room with the witness um, uh, th that might risk um, you know, the perception of feeding them answers or coaching them or anything like that. Uh, there are ways of setting up the room so you can ensure that that's the case and give give confidence to people for whom they still want the right to test credibility and reliability 
Um, so I, I think it's um, it, the concern was overblown, and but I leave that to people that have that have had the experience with in-person hearings who initially had those concerns to say whether they they still do. From my perspective, it's um, it's it is overblown. Okay, thank you. And uh, for my final act, I will urge you to fill out the survey, which I think Bree is providing the link to in the chat, and will no doubt appear before you in some other form as well. Um, and thank our panelists very much on your behalf and turn it back over to Brent Cotter. Uh, thank you, Beth. Um, in that uh, part of the discussion concerning uh, citizen oriented dispute resolution that uh, Shannon Salter spoke about, I was reminded of an event uh, 25 years ago when we were taking baby steps in the province to move to the introduction of mediation in civil dispute resolution processes. Uh, Dan will remember that period of time, I think. Um, and I was at a consultation session with a number of lawyers in Saskatoon concerning it. And one of the lawyers concerned that disputes would get resolved peacefully and constructively through mediation said uh, to the audience, uh, but, but if we do that, where will we get our jurisprudence? Uh, which seemed to suggest that uh, the, the litigants existed for the purpose of the system and maybe not the other way around. And it just reminded me of the value of looking at it through the lens in the opposite direction. So let me thank uh, uh, Dean Bilson for chairing this uh, very informative panel and the opportunity of, of each of the three panelists, uh, uh, Chief, Jov Chief Judge Metivier, um, Shannon Salter and Dan Shapiro to talk deeply about uh, these questions and models of improved adjudication using online mechanisms and other tools that you've heard about. I also want to extend thanks to the McKercher Law Firm who are the sponsors of the uh, lecture series and speaker series at our College of Law and also to the attendees who have hung in there for a rich uh, presentation today. Um, only moments ago we slipped below 100 attendees which is really remarkable and I want to thank all of you who have joined and, and attended, and I hope the experience has been a valuable one for you. And I'll just mention, if I may, that uh, next week on Monday, the series will continue and uh, deal with a different topic. Um, Erica Dick, a professor at the University of Saskatchewan, and David Wood, a graduate who practices law in Calgary, will be speaking about psychiatric, uh, sorry, psychedelic psychiatry, psychiatry, the historical evolution of medical experimentation culture wars, drug policy, and the use of medical psychedelics uh, in Canada. Uh, an interesting and different topic. I hope you'll come alert to that as well. That will be next Monday, November 1st, uh, starting at noon. So to close the session, once again, thanks to you all. It's been very informative for me and I think for the whole audience. And I wanted to thank you for the rich conversation and the extensive time you've dedicated to talking with us about it. Thanks very much and have a great day.